This is the city, Los Angeles, California. It sprawls over 467 square miles, and three million people call it home. It's the biggest police beat in the world, yet it has fewer policemen per thousand population than any major city in the United States. On paper, one policeman must protect and serve more than 600 citizens. It's a big job and a big responsibility. Every police officer carries a gun. Once a month on the pistol range, he has to prove he knows how to use it. Someday he may have to. When that day comes, I go to work. I carry a badge. It was Wednesday, September 17th. It was cloudy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide. The boss is Captain Hugh Brown. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. A liquor store owner had been shot and killed while trying to resist a robbery. For the last 18 hours, Bill and I had been interviewing witnesses and interrogating suspects. A polygraph lie detector test had cleared the last and only suspect we had. It was 2 a.m. when we quit for the day. It had been a long day, and another one would begin in about five hours. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. One dead liquor store owner, four conflicting witnesses, no suspects. Well, we'll have one thing we don't have now, won't we? What's that? About four hours sleep. We sleep fast. 2.35 a.m. After I got home, I noticed I was out of cigarettes. I knew there was a machine in an all-night launderette two blocks from my apartment. I walked over. All right, fella, police officer. Stand up and keep those hands where I can see them. Sergeant Friday, Homicide Division. I've been involved in the shooting, 459. I'm okay, but the suspect got away in a 1964 Dodge convertible. Dark blue with a black top. Suspect is male, Caucasian, 23, 160. Blue zipper jacket, he's armed and wounded. There's a woman with him, young blonde woman, last seen driving west on Vermont. No, I didn't get it. Send a radio unit to 331 East Vermont. It's a launderette, will you please? Right, and switch me up to THQ. Bob, Joe, Friday. I'm at a launderette, 331 East Vermont. I just shot a burglar. He's wounded, but he got away. Would you make the notifications and call Homicide and get the shooting team over here to check it out? Yeah. No, I'm all right. Radio car's on the way. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Under strict policy established by the Los Angeles Police Department, an officer is subject to investigation every time he fires his service revolver, except on the firing range. I was no different. A special team of police officers would have to investigate the shooting and report directly to the chief of police. A board of inquiry would also determine if the shooting was within departmental policy. 2.52 a.m. Paul and Vincent, 2A12. Friday, homicide. What's the story? 
Man was slip wearing that coin changer. He took a shot at me. I returned fire. He ran out the back door. Male cock, 23 to 25, 6 feet, 160 pounds, blonde hair, blue zipper jacket, tan slacks, white shirt. Car was parked out back. 1964 Dodge convertible, dark blue with a black top. Young blonde girl with him. She was driving the car. Right. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. You better move on it. The guy hits bleeding pretty bad. He's going to need medical help. Right. Want us to call the shooting team? They're on the way. Hey, either one of you got a cigarette? Machine's out of order. Keep the pack. Thanks. Three oh seven a.m. The investigating team, Lieutenants Pierce Brooks and Danny Bowser, arrived. Friday, Danny Pierce, you got here in a hurry. Want to fill us in, Joe? Right. About two forty, I came in here to buy a pack of cigarettes. The suspect was working a slip wire on this coin changer. I thought he dropped the wire. I don't see it, do you? Nope. Well, we exchanged fire. I hit him, and he took off through that back door there. Where were you shot? Better see a doctor in a hurry. Where were you during the shooting, Joe? Right over there by those machines. I identified myself. I told him to stand. He came up shooting. Uh, this is where you were, huh? right here? That's right. He fired, I drew, and attempted to return fire. He threw a waste can at me. I fired back. I hit him. He started to run. I went around through there after him, and I bumped into some laundry carts. He threw another waste can. I attempted to fire once more. There was a woman waiting for him by the door. She got between him and me. She's a blonde girl. I got a pretty good look at her. She hustled him out the door. I saw a car scratch off, a 64 Dodge convertible. The woman was driving. Yeah. Radio unit was here a few minutes after I called in. If you were here and he fired from over there, there should be a slug in that wall somewhere. What did you say you came in here for, Joe? Cigarettes. The machine's out of order. You live near here, don't you, Joe? Yeah, two blocks over. How long a shift did you work? Day watch. Plus a little overtime. Well, I checked in at 7.30 yesterday morning. I clocked out at 2 a.m. this morning. That's 18 and a half hours. You must be beat. Nobody has a corner on long hours, Pierce. Brooks, Friday. Can't find a thing. You sure this was his line of fire at you? Positive. It must be there someplace. I can't find a slug, not even a hole. Take a look, Joe. We'll get a team from SID to come out and go over it with a fine-tooth comb. Let's go downtown and get your statement while it's fresh in your mind. I'd like to find that slug now. It's late, Joe. SID will turn it tomorrow. It's here. It's got to be. So will that wall tomorrow. <laughs> Three thirty-two a.m. We returned to the police administration building. Three radio units were checking the area. So far, they had found no trace of the suspect or the car he was driving. Here's what we got, Joe. We don't have any way to prove that coin changer was tampered with. No slip wire left behind. Well, he must have taken it with him. Unless the crime lab turned something, there's no proof the suspect took a shot at you, Joe. And we don't have a body. Maybe he isn't hit as bad as you think. You saw the blood on the floor. Yeah, we saw it. Less than 30 feet from where I shot him. Now, you know when a man's bleeding like that, one thing's sure. Yeah. There's gonna be a body. We agree with him. All right. Any red-hot ideas where he might have gone to die? 1 September 17th, 9 a.m. I arrived at the police administration building to report for work. It hadn't been much of a night. Had coffee with Danny and Pierce this morning. You did. I'm gonna have to start taking you home nights. I guess. This might help. Found the body an hour ago. They're posting it now. Name's Arthur Ashton. Girl with him, her name is Marianne Smith. Pulled Ashton's mug. That's him. That's the guy. Petty larceny, burglary, nothing heavy. Bowser Brooks in? They're bringing in the Smith girl. Oh, yeah. Captain wants to see you. Sit down, Joe. Chief called a few minutes ago. Yes, sir. Pending a board, I'd better relieve you from field duty. Yes, sir, I understand. You've got some vacation time coming. Want to take it now? No, sir. I just soon stay on the job. Sure. Good time to catch up on your paperwork. Yes, sir. Joe, I know you're concerned about not turning that slug this morning. SID's out there now. You know if it's in that wall, they'll dig it out. There's no if, Captain. That isn't what I meant, and you know it. I'm sorry. I guess I got a spring someplace and it's just wound up too tight. You're tired and you're concerned. I don't like to see you tired. If you weren't concerned, I wouldn't want you in my division. Yes, sir. 
In all the years I've been on the job, I've only had to drop the hammer on a man twice. Then you've been in front of a board of inquiry before. You know all they want's the truth, and you're telling it. Yes, sir, but the first time there were eyeball witnesses, my partner, the other suspect. What about this Smith girl? She undoubtedly saw the shooting. Let's get her statement. Understand Brooks and Boz are on their way in with her now. You know, I like my job, Skipper. I wouldn't want to lose it. Nobody says you're going to, Friday. Now, why don't you hop upstairs to SID? Ballistics will want your gun as soon as the coroner recovers the slug from Ashton. Yes, sir. You'll be close to the cafeteria. Have some coffee and a smoke. Find that spring and unwind it. Yes, sir. Excuse me, Captain. Bowser and Brooks just got in with the Smith girl. Yeah. Claims she and Ashton were living in his car back of a service station over on Rampart. Says they didn't have any place else to stay. Danny and Pierce shook the car down, found the slip wire he was trying to trip the coin changer with. How about Ashton's gun? They find it? No, Joe. They didn't. September 17th, 11.15 a.m. I was returning from SID where I had taken my revolver for a comparison test with a slug that would be removed from Arthur Ashton's body. Joe. Got the Smith girl in there. she tell you anything? Nothing that'll help. Keep screaming murder. Says you deliberately shot Ashton. He didn't fire at you. She's lying. We'll stay with it, Joe. You see Brooks now? Waiting for you inside. There's a problem, Joe. Brooks will fill you in. I better get back in there. Right, thanks, Danny. We turned a gun. Could be Ashton's. Bowser says you got a problem. King size. We found a 38 6 inch revolver at the bottom of a drum of waste oil. That tears it, doesn't it? The oil drum was in back of the service station where the Smith girl claims she and Ashton are living in the car. No prints, no powder residue. Too much blood on Ashton's hands for a paraffin test. How about an empty casing in the cylinder? Gun wasn't loaded, Joe. p.m. The board of inquiry was scheduled to convene at 4 o'clock. I took the elevator up to the fifth floor to report to the Administrative Services Bureau. I was instructed to report to the office of Deputy Chief Robert Houghton. Bowser and Brooks had filed their reports with the board earlier. The board of inquiry is made up of three ranking police officers. The chairman, Deputy Chief Houghton, had 25 years service in the department. He was my first division commander. Inspector John Powers, Detective Bureau, a veteran of 26 years. Deputy Chief Roger Murdoch, Traffic Bureau. This Board of Inquiry is now in session. This hearing will be informal. Its sole purpose is to determine whether the shooting under consideration is or is not within department policy. We want to know whether the use of force was necessary, legal, and justified under the circumstances. Have the members of the board read the report of the investigating officers? Are there any questions? Lieutenant Bowser. Yes, sir. I commend you and Brooks on the thoroughness of your report. However, on two points, it seems to be at odds with Sergeant Friday's statement. Yes, sir. Sergeant Friday states he returned fire. Did you conduct a thorough search of the area for the bullet he claims the deceased fired? As indicated in our report, both Lieutenant Brooks and I, as well as a three-man team from SID, examined the walls and the floor and the ceiling of the laundrette. We were unable to find any bullet holes or the spent slug. How many cases involving officers returning fire have you two investigated? Offhand, I don't know, sir. I'd guess in excess of 20. In any of those cases, have you ever failed to find proof that the officer was fired upon? No, sir. Thank you. Lieutenant Brooks, this girl acquainted with the suspect, Marianne Smith. What can you tell us about her? Claims she's in love with the deceased. When the deceased was found, she was holding him in her arms, crying. She said they've been living together for three months. There is no record of marriage. You said in your report that she's a runaway. Yes, sir. She was in a foster home. The situation was less than ideal. She ran away in January. The family didn't file a missing report till June. I see. Any record? Nothing local. Till two weeks ago, she was employed as a waitress. She left the job? Said she couldn't stand the smell of food. She thinks she's pregnant. Uh, the deceased, Arthur Ashton, this is complete record? Yes, sir. Three arrests for petty larceny, one for burglary, one conviction, sentence suspended. Lieutenant Brooks, how long have you known Friday? Well, we went through the academy together. You know him well, then? I believe so. When you arrived at the laundrette, 3.07 a.m., did Friday appear upset, tired, anything like that? He looked like a man who just shot somebody. I'm sure nobody in this room enjoys pulling the trigger. Well, we understand that. But uh, Friday had been working since 7.30 the previous morning. Did he look tired? 
Yes, sir, he did. Now, upon your arrival, what did he say to you? As we said in our written report, Sergeant Friday told us he'd given a description of the suspect and the suspect's car to the responding radio unit, 2A12. He then reconstructed the incident in detail. Lieutenant, I am sure there was some exchange of conversation other than his report. It's important for us to know Friday's physical and mental condition at the time. We know he'd been working for 18 hours, investigating the murder of a liquor store owner. We know that the only suspect in that case was cleared less than an hour before Friday was involved in the shooting. Yes, sir, that's correct. Now, did Friday say or do anything not directly connected to the facts of the shooting? No, sir, not to my recollection. Anything else you care to add at this time? No, sir, I believe the report covers it. Thank you, Lieutenant. Officer Gannon. Yes, sir. You were working with Sergeant Friday Tuesday night, September 16th, just prior to the shooting, is that right? Yes, sir, that's right. How did he appear to you when you last saw him that night? He seemed fine. How long have you and Sergeant Friday worked as a team? Five years. You two in the habit of working such long hours? When it becomes necessary, yes, sir. How many accrued days do you and Friday have on the books, Officer Gannon? You mean total? Individually. I have 87. I think Joe has 90-some-odd. How long did you and Friday work the previous day? That would be Monday the 15th. We signed out a little past midnight. How far past midnight? 2.30 a.m. In the 48 hours prior to the shooting, you and Sergeant Friday had about 8 or 10 hours sleep total. Is that right? Sometimes it's part of the job. It's also part of the job to remain alert at all times. A tired man can't always do that. Joe was alert when he left me, sir, and I'm sure he was alert in that laundrette. Well, one thing's certain, isn't it? Yes, sir. Like the rest of us, you weren't there, were you, Officer Gannon? No, sir, I wasn't. Thank you, Officer Gannon. Sergeant Friday, I have the report here from SID on the 38 caliber revolver found in the oil drum. Because of the immersion, there's no evidence indicating it had been fired. There is no evidence the weapon was ever in the possession of the deceased. The sole witness, Mary Ann Smith, has signed a statement in which she accuses you of willfully murdering Arthur Ashton. That's not true, sir. I went into that laundrette to buy some cigarettes. I saw the suspect, Ashton, slip wearing that coin changer. I identified myself and ordered him to stand. He came up shooting. Yes, that's all in the report here. Joe, let me ask you something. Yes, sir. You were tired. You put in a couple of long days. Is it just possible you thought Ashton had a gun? He made a furtive movement. Here's a man in the act of committing a felony. You surprise him. He makes a sudden move as if drawing a gun. You take cover and fire, all in a split second, all by instinct and training. Is that possible? No, sir, that's not possible. The suspect had a revolver, and he fired at me. I returned fire. Sergeant Friday, is this a possibility? The suspect had a gun, as you report he did. Could it have been loaded with blanks? Thieves have been known to have used empty weapons or blanks to frighten victims. They don't want to risk the death penalty. Blank makes a big noise, the same as a live round. Maybe that's why no slug from the suspect's gun's been recovered. There wasn't one. No, sir. If Ashton had fired a blank, there would have been fragments of wadding on the floor or on the wall. No, he shot at me, and it wasn't a blank. Lieutenant Bowser, both you and Lieutenant Brooks interrogated Mary Ann Smith. Did you both concur in your findings? Yes, sir. Do you think she's giving a straight story? We're of the opinion it sounds rehearsed. It sounds pat. We've played the tapes back three times, and she told us a story three times. They don't differ in more than a single word here and there. But you're not sure she's lying? We can't prove it, no, sir. We'd like to examine those tapes, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. Would you like me to set it up now? No, the board would like to have them here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Yes, sir. Let the records show that according to Ballistics Report 11109, a 38 caliber slug was recovered from the body of deceased one Arthur Ashton. The bullet being fired from a Smith & Wesson revolver, serial 1755806. The aforementioned weapon belonging to Sergeant Joe Friday, Los Angeles Police Department. This board of inquiry is in recess until 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Wednesday, September 17th, 5.03 p.m. It didn't look too good. Joe. Yeah? For what it's worth, I want you to know something. What's that? I'm not saying the board doesn't, but I want you to know I believe you. So do I. Come on in a minute. It isn't a matter of belief, and I know you two know that. I also know I'm about to tell you a lot of other things you know. Sit down. Let me have your badge, Friday. You were issued this when you first came on the job. Twenty bucks worth of brass and pot metal in a two-dollar leather case. You were told to give it a regular polish or to tarnish. It's easy to keep the metal bright and clean, but what about the men who carry it? The department set up that board of inquiry. We did, ourselves. 
No political pressures, no citizens groups, just us. And it's been in business for 15 years. I've faced it before, so have a lot of others. Sometimes the going's rough, it has to be. But it's the best way to get at the truth we know of. We live in a free and open society. That's why that board was set up. I don't have to tell you we don't sweep things under the rug here. No whitewashing of anybody or anything. That's why this hunk of metal means something and why it always will. It's not something we hide behind. It's something we live up to. Believe me, I know what you're going through, Joe. Board rules against you it means a possible jury trial for manslaughter. Dismissal from the force. But I know this, too. You want this thing cleaned up with facts, not opinions. And that's the way it's going to be. You men are professionals at your job. And when you get involved, you're judged first by professionals, just like yourselves. Men who aren't out to whitewash you. Men who aren't out to bury you. I wouldn't want it any other way, and neither would you. Because the alternative sickens me. None of us ever want to see this turned into a hunting license. Brown. Yeah, right here. Good. On the way now. That was Bowser. Hop out to that laundrette. They've turned something. Five forty-five p.m. Bill and I left the police administration building and headed across town to the laundrette. When we got there, Lieutenants Pierce Brooks and Danny Bowser were waiting for us. Pierce, Danny, Bowser and I refigured the line of travel from the coin changer to this wall, bearing in mind the general area of where you said you were standing the night of the shooting. Yeah. We checked this entire wall for the tenth time. We gave up. Check the ceiling again, figuring on a possible ricochet. Yeah. Nothing, till Brooks noticed something. It's one for the books, Joe. Picture the line of travel and look underneath this shelf. You make that pencil mark? We didn't make it. Ashton did, and the pencil didn't do it. Here's the way it goes, Joe. You had the geography right almost to the inch. Ashton fired at you from over there. His slug just slid along underneath the shelf, making that mark. Barely touched the wood. Pierce and I both passed it up twice. Wrote it off as a carpenter's mark. Lead slug will make a mark like that. Force of the slug raised the shelving material like this. And look what's here. Take a good look, Joe. It's been hiding a long time. Nothing ever happens the easy way to you, does it? Thanks, Danny. Pierce. Right. You ought to sleep a little better tonight, huh? Oh, I'm sure of it. Go on home. We'll finish up here. Here. Try and stay out of trouble, will you? What's this? A carton of cigarettes. just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On Thursday, September 18th, the shooting board of inquiry of the Los Angeles Police Department held a final hearing on the shooting of Arthur Ashton. In a moment, the results of that hearing. As a result of the finding of the bullet from Arthur Ashton's gun, the board held that Sergeant Joe Friday had fired in the line of duty and that the shooting was within departmental policy. On September 23rd, a coroner's jury hearing the same case also brought in a verdict of justifiable homicide. Mary Ann Smith was again made a ward of juvenile court and later placed in another foster home. <laughs> 